Well, I have been a women's health nurse practitioner since 1985. And so some of the beginning things that we're talking about with polycystic ovarian syndrome were still happening when I first started practice. And so it's been one of those syndromes, so to speak, that has <coughs> just always bothered me because I felt like I didn't fully have a good treatment for it. And it was really deep. It was so endocrine laden. And it was just kind of the simplest thing to do was put everybody on birth control pills and maybe metformin and call it a day. And so actually when I was at an Aforium, an integrative medicine conference um, last year, I heard an OBGYN, um, Dr. Felice Gersh from Irvine, California. And it really was so exciting to me because it put so many things in place. And she was saying even that, you know, if you have questions because there's no time to ask questions when there's 2,000 people in the audience, she'd be at this booth and I hot-fitted it right down there to her booth and said, you got to publish this. And she actually is in the process of doing that. So when that book comes out, I'll be writing a review for it and Dr. Davis will put it up on our website. So you can, it's not close. I did call and talk to the, the uh, office manager I thought maybe I could promo it tonight, but it's, it's not there. But I'll be excited because that's going to be one of the best things I have found anyway coming. So stay tuned on that one. So when we look at the functional or integrative medicine, what that, uh, sometimes I think I want to clarify what that means. What I did for so many of, so much of my career was basically kind of here's your symptom, here's your drug, okay, here's your symptom, here's your drug. And in fact, I, about five years ago, was just totally going to get out of this and just go sh show my horses because the hormones they wanted me to get to postmenopausal women, I already knew enough were going to be more damaging than helpful. And also, of when I'd see ladies on 10, 15 medications, I just wanted to puke. I just thought, we have so failed. And I didn't even want my name on it, didn't even want to be a part of it. So when I found the integrative or functional medicine, where we look at trying to get the body back to where it's functioning as it should, then you start peeling people off medications, then it got excited again. And it was just, and it is, it's so, it's so fun um, to be a part of a team where that's what our focus is. And especially when we look at polycystic ovarian syndrome, oh my gosh, do we ever need an integrative approach? Because from, from my perspective, the traditional approach of birth control pills, metformin, is not nearly deep enough. It just doesn't cut the problem. So it's very exciting to see that. So when we look at defining polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's actually been around for quite a while. In 1935, Dr. Irving Stein and Michael Leventhal, both OBGYNs, noticed that there was an increase, whenever there was an increased number of ovarian cysts, that many times those ladies had ovulation problems. And it was just like there was, it was all confused. There was just, when we normally have maybe 10 to 15 follicles each month in our ovaries, these ladies may have 30 on each side. And so they just, there's so many of them, but they just are not getting the messages they need to have a monthly ovulation. So they thought, well, we're just going to take out some of the noise that's going on here. And they literally did wedge resections where they cut out part of the ovary or they did laparoscopic ovarian drilling where they literally drilled holes in the ovary to try to take out some of the mass and some of those multiple cysts that were there. And lo and behold, some ladies did start having monthly cycles after for a while, but then it would revert back to having more issues again. There was also a lot of ovarian scarring from that, as you can imagine. So when we look at a polycystic ovary, ovary itself, it's kind of oftentimes referred to as a string of pearls, where we would maybe have those 10 to 15 follicles split between the two ovaries. These just line up like little soldiers around the outside of an ovary, where they should be kind of scattered within the whole thing. And it's, the main thing to remember about this is that that is a sign of an endocrine dysfunction. It's not a disease itself. And to me, that's encouraging because it means that there's more things that we can do to help. So this young lady kind of demonstrates sometimes some of the symptoms that we may see with ladies that have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So they may have thinning hair, um, and some of that can be genetic origin as well, but many times it's because there's too many andro andro androgens or like testosterone on board. 
hair on the back, acne again, usually from too much of the uh, androgens, hair on the chest, breast, hair on lip, neck, and uh, chin, ovarian cyst again, having those 30 follicles instead of the 10 to 15. A male is cruciate may call it, but a hair on the abdomen, usually from the belly button down to the pubic hair line. Excess weight, especially around the waist, and that's because there's a lot of extra um, cortisol that's being produced, and cortisol just loves tummy fat because it can store about four times as much cortisol in tummy fat as it can in any other muscle in the body. Um, dark discolored skin spots, which is called acanthosis nigricans, it can be very velvety in appearance and is usually associated with insulin resistance. Infertility, because they're many times they're not ovulating normally. Missed periods, again, because of that. And also of having some just sores, but most of the time inside like the, the uh, groin area, or upper thighs. So the, when we look at the prevalence of PCOS um, and of looking at anovulation itself for the number of women with this that are not ovulating, 50%. So one of the things that, that is so interesting is just as unique as each one of our personalities is also the presentation that may be there with this syndrome. So it's not like 100% of ladies are gonna not ovulate. Some of them will, some of them won't, some of them will for a time and then they stop. Um, hirsutism, which is kind of that hairiness as far as on the, on the face, chin, neck. Acne, 53%. Alopecia, which is that hair thinning, and again, genetics may be a part of that, 16%. Dysmenorrhea, which means cramping when they're on their periods, 30%. Obesity to be a factor in this, 81%. Insulin resistance, um, 38%. And polycystic ovaries seen like on an ultrasound, 86%. So again, nothing is 100%. And so ladies can have polycystic of, uh, appearing ovaries on Sanos and not have polycystic ovary syndrome or vice versa. I mean, there's just, this is what, again, sometimes makes this so difficult is because it's not, everybody presents a little bit uniquely. But that's what we try to do around here is individualized medicine. We figure out what everybody's risk factors are for them personally, and then we treat them personally. So it just kind of fits into what we do with the integrated medicine. So there is a small subgroup of PCOS patients who are lean but often may still have some of the glucose and insulin issues. So by far the biggest commonality that we had there was the obesity, but then there's the skinny as a little rail PCOS patients as well. So again, looking at what her symptoms are <coughs> as far as her, um, if she starts having cycles routinely or that. So what starts all this in motion? Well, you know, we have different theories about that. Um, some feel that it is a X-linked dominant transmission that many times we'll see. And you see this, there can be PCOS in family members, uh, mothers passing this on to their daughters. Uh, many times, you know, the, the, the sons feel like they got scotch-free on this deal, but actually they haven't. They can have increased incidences as far as developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease as well. So they need to make sure that they're being, that their physician knows that that's their family history because they can um, have some of the same endocrine issues. There's differences as far as with the hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction. And again, this is where it gets really kind of endocrine wise, but it's everything that kind of starts all of our hormones in motion kind of starts from that area and many of the downstream effects of that will affect the ovary and therefore we see more problems. Some people feel that it, the problem is not in the brain with the hypothalamus and the pituitary but more it's more of an ovarian problem and that's where this all starts to go awry and some of the things that can be seen with that is also realizing that the adrenal gland that makes cortisol is also very much involved. Um, and when we, when we look at, for my little brain, when I'm trying to figure out where to, how to approach integrated medicine, we know that cortisol 
one of the main adrenal hormones, is the strongest hormone in the body. So me working with women's health, and I use a lot of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol is just huge in comparison to the sex hormones. But when cortisol is awry, it's gonna rock everybody. Thyroid, sex hormones, everybody. So an example of that is like young ladies, maybe at K-State in May and in December, who get so stressed out about finals, then the body says, hey, I don't know what's going on, but you know, we're, we gotta survive this deal. And it just shuts the breaker down on menstrual periods. And she'll skip that month. She won't even have a cycle. Because there was enough suppression of those sex hormones that it just shut it down, said we don't have enough energy for everything else. Don't know what's going on. So um, there's a lot of things, a lot of influences onto the menstrual cycle. Some of them is that it can be a metabolic issue and that it's insulin resistance that can cause an issue. And indeed, we do know that when there is elevated insulin resistance, that does cause problems with ovarian function and especially of having regular cycles. So if there's too much insulin, that's another reason of where it can just kind of shut the ovaries down and they don't work right. It exerts a, its a adverse effect on, again, the hypothalamic pituitary and the adrenals. All these guys have such an amazing um, pathways of talking to each other. Then there are kind of what I call the self-induced PCOS patients. The, the ones with the mothers and daughters, these are ladies that were born probably with that genetic predisposition. And we're going to talk a little bit more about specifically how that kind of gets all jacked up. But these are the ladies that maybe through weight gain of themselves, they kind of put themselves into that syndrome. And again, we, they can get themselves out of it as well, which is the good news of all of that. Um, but how did they get there? Well, probably because they were eating the standard American diet, which is sugar, um, things fried, things highly processed, um, gluten, you know, all of that. Um, and increase in amount of stress. You know, we, we take our computers with us and everything else when we go on vacation. In Europe, they get the three month holidays, you know. Um, lack of sleep and of being able to just uh, cheat sleep for trying to get other things done. We know that when we get in that deep REM sleep, that's when we're restoring our immune system. That's when we're making our neurotransmitters that help us cope with stress. So again, when we're cheating that, you're gonna dip into cortisol the next day, that strongest hormone to give you energy to go, but at a price, and that's inflammation. So inflammation is always enemy number one. It is the basement foundation of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, all the autoimmune diseases. So we're always trying to get inflammation down in the body. So lack of exercise is another one of we just, in, especially when trying to help with um, insulin resistance. So some of the environmental things, this is where it kind of gets to be very interesting in our toxic world that we live in right now. When we look at epigenetics, what that basically means is that, and let's just pick on breast cancer. If you have a strong family history of breast cancer, that means that you've kind of got, this, the saying goes that that genetics loads the gun as far as your development of breast cancer. But actually what determines whether you pull the trigger and you get breast cancer or not, many times is on your environmental exposures. And for me, I grew up on a cattle ranch. We use Roundup like it was water. And Roundup is an endocrine disruptor. Um, it is like a fake estrogen, if you will. And it can have very nasty effects as we deal with that. Um, so it's what our lifetime exposures are to things like that. Um, also to our lifestyle choices that we've made. Do we want to eat the highly processed, high carbs, <laughs> fried foods? Um, do we want to not get sleep? Do we want to not exercise? Do we want to be high stressed? Then all of those things, it's actually the lifestyle choices, lifestyle, environmental exposures that probably are the ones that really pull the trigger on whether we develop breast cancer or not. So that's kind of the epigenetics as far as, yes, here's your genes, but that doesn't mean it's 100% that you're gonna get breast cancer too. 
It just means you have the genetic propensity for that. Whether you actually develop it or not are some of your choices that you make. So some of these environmental um, factors. So we definitely live in a much more toxic world now than even what my parents or grandparents lived in. Um, when they've done studies on placentas after babies have been born, we realize that the fetuses have been exposed to over 287 different toxic substances that that little fetal in utero liver had to process, had to go through. And some of those things are going to be like the Roundup, the bisphenol A's, um, chlorine that's in chlorine pools, that's in sanitizing your water, um, in your beauty products. You know, in Europe, they ban toxic substances incredibly higher than what we do. And so many times there's toxic things even in your makeup. But there's all kinds of neat apps that are out there as far as things that you can look at and you can check for like whatever your beauty supplies that you use to see if it is high on the toxic scales or not. As the embryo divides quickly, an introduction of a wrong chemical at the wrong time can have different outcomes where it may have mild effects or it may have catastrophic effects, which like may end up in a miscarriage. So especially in those early months of gestation, when that fastly dividing cells, that's when these fake estrogens like bisphenol A or Roundup or chlorine, just to name a few, that those guys can get in there and sit on an estrogen receptor and send the wrong signal. So when real estrogen shows up, it can't do what it's supposed to do. I don't know how many of you have heard about DES, diethylstabestrol. It was the, it actually won, uh, BPA lost out on that. And DES was developed as the first synthetic estrogen to help women who had miscarriages supposedly go to full term. Um, and it was dire consequences that ended up then with those babies that were exposed to DES as far as more um, uh, cancers, particularly for them. We watched them very closely because of that. So it was a disaster, let's say. But um, BPA did find a way to be used, and it ended up in polycarbonate plastic, which is like in water bottles. And it leaches out BPA more when that plastic gets hot. Well, I don't know how many times you've been, you've been around like a quick trip or something like that, and you see that literally there's pallets of plastic water bottles sitting out in the sun before they then get loaded into a refrigerator someplace. Well, again, that's one of the ways in which BPA leaches out of that plastic into the water. Um, it's an epoxy resin that is lines inside cans of food. It is in PVC pipe. Um, it is in pediatric dental sealants, although not all of them. I have it from a very good source. My husband's a dentist and he says he knows which ones have BPA, he doesn't use them. So I think that that's readily available to dentists to know. But if you do have a child that needs a sealant, I would certainly ask about that. Um, thermal crash register receipt paper. You know, unless I've charged something, I don't even take it. I don't even want to touch this stuff. Um, and also like your airline tickets, many times will have BPA on that as well. So if you've gone shopping and all that, you've probably had your daily dose of BPA. So it's one of those things of, it's just riddled in our environment. So what are the things that we can do as far as trying to get BPA out of our system? Number one, we want to try to avoid it wherever we can. But then also things like probiotics, the good probiotics and good old fashioned sweat are gonna, you can sweat BPA out of your system. So each baby has a unique genetic profile. And there again, some of those exposures that that baby gets while it's still in utero can then develop into unique expressions, perhaps of PCOS. By the time that a baby is six months gestation, that little baby girl is gonna have all the eggs she's ever had, gonna have for her life. And when we ovulate out our last egg, that, and you haven't had a period for a year, that's when you become menopausal. 
So up until those early months of in utero life is when all of these things are getting set up into motion. So it has, a, when, as that baby is developing, it has an estrogenic effects, but they can scramble the messages to the cells. This is just of what endocrine disruptors themselves can do. Some believe that BPA is a major contributor to PCOS. And again, of why we want to be looking at these different endocrine disruptors. I was just down, at, our family was on a vacation at um, Table Rock last week, and I noticed this gentleman that, you know, everything grows down there like crazy. So I understand his concern. He had his little pump up bottle of Roundup, and he was out in his flip flops and in his shorts, and he was spraying, you know, the weeds around his driveway and everything. And of course, in my morbid mind, maybe, but I was thinking, okay, he's just sprayed his flip-flops and his shoes, and he's gonna go walk in the house on his carpet, probably. And then his little six-month-old granddaughter's gonna come over and just crawl all over that carpet, and on and on it goes. But it really is something that I think that we need to, to look at that. Again, I was raised with Roundup like crazy. I still use it, I live in the country, I hate buying weed, but I look like I'm part of a hazmat team when I use it now. I have on my chainsaw goggles, I wear a mask, I wear long sleeves, I have the cheap gloves that I throw away um, afterwards, long sleeves, jeans, boots, you know, jeans tucked in the boots. I mean, I look like I'm part of a hazmat team. So I have that much respect for it. And I think that that's where, when we realize these things, and you know, and especially how I look at, at pregnant women now compared to where I've been, oh my gosh. I used to give a single prenatal vitamin that they were all pink because they had red food dye in them. I was really focusing on the folic acid and the methylated B vitamins. Now I give packets of about four different supplements in the prenatal vitamins. And my conversation with prenatal, with prenatal women and early pregnant moms is so much different now than what it used to be when I was back in traditional OBGYN. So in early infancy, you can see, you know, kind of the chubby little kiddos and some of them when they start walking don't lose that extra weight. Um, already from that get-go, they may be starting to have some problems as far as how they transport glucose and utilize it. Um, sometimes I've already seen in childhood, early childhood fatigue, some of the mood disorders that may be there. By age seven, we can measure adiponectin which is, is made by the fat cells themselves and can already kind of predict whether this chubby little seven-year-old just may be eating more carbs than for the exercise she's getting or does she maybe have something endocrine going on. In adolescence, when you think about all these potential endocrine things that can go awry ahead of time, and then in adolescence, you know, the many times they're not eating a good diet. They may not be getting all the sleep that they need. Um, there's a lot of carbs, a lot of, lot of pizzas, lots of gluten, all those foods that are inflammatory. Um, a lot of high fructose corn syrup, um, all those, uh, the pop, all that, to where the body just becomes in a chronic state of mild inflammation and insulin resistance, and then probably even further more BPA exposure or other, those other endocrine disruptors. So at puberty itself, kind of how this all kind of gets starting, which I think is just absolutely amazing. Um, this may be a snooze to you if you're not interested in endocrinology, but this is just, you know, we have our, our eggs are in suspended animation from six months gestation till usually about 11, 12 years old. And it goes through a process of kind of awakening, if you will. And so part of that process is gonna be this whole thing here. We ovulate out our best eggs first. That's why those 14, 15 year old girls so easily get pregnant. And then when we're 35, it starts getting a little bit harder. And then when we're in our 40th decade, we're into perimenopause and getting into the older and older eggs that are more dysfunctional. Most women in the United States go through menopause 50-51. So as we're starting this whole thing, as a, that 11, 12-year-old young lady, 
what happens is that the adrenal glands send down DHEA, which is an androgen, to kind of signal to start growing pubic hair and axillary hair. Um, and those can be some of the first signs that somebody is maybe kind of starting up to have cycles. Um, DHES becomes testosterone, which is one of the reasons of where it can then produce some of the acne that happens. Um, cortisol secretion increases and cortisol is a fat storage hormone. So again, the ladies that don't sleep well, they're getting into cortisol the next day to give them the energy to go. Um, but again, many times that cortisol loves to just find its little happy home around the abdomen because it can store more cortisol there. It's a fat storage hormone. Unless we can get cortisol levels down, women are not gonna lose this tummy fat. I mean, it's just, it's just working against us. Um, but that's we, we need to have some of that weight gain, some of the fat on the hips. Breasts are just fat tissue. And so when you see this little stick little girl and she starts to get those rounded hips and she starts to get her little breast buds, that's those extra fats that are happening, but it's not isolated fat. It actually is going to be driving more of this endocrine system. So the body makes androgens there or like testosterone, the DHEA first, and then it converts those into estrogen through a process of aromatization. And it is a, aromatization is, is a, aromatase is an enzyme of how it does that. That's where when you, when you see ladies that are really big, big ladies, like today I saw a lady like that, and she was 51 years old, and she was still having periods, but they were getting really kind of sketchy, which they do at that point. And I automatically did a sauna on her because she's at increased risk for every estrogen cancer known to man. And lo and behold, she had a more than double the thickness of an endometrial lining. Mm -hmm. And so that's because even if your ovaries are in a path lab someplace, if you have that extra tummy fat, through the process of aromatization, your body's gonna turn that into estrogens, estrone. And estrone is the main estrogen that likes to cause breast cancer. And so that's where ladies that are really heavier are going to be at such an increased risk as far as for um, estrogen-dependent cancers. Aromatase is found in fat cells and mature follicles. Um, without adequate fat, there's less estrogen and a delay of onset of menses. So when we see ladies that have um, anorexia or athletes who are overtraining, that many times there's not enough, literally enough fat on their bodies to make estrogen. And so one of the things that whenever I get to talk to coaches, I always say, okay, somebody on the volleyball team, one of the coaches, somebody on the track team needs to be talking to, about, to young ladies, are you still having menses? Because if they're not, they need that estrogen or else they're gonna develop osteoporosis, even at a very young age. Now that's reversible. Once they get estrogens again, they'll, they'll make that bone back. Um, but that's where we, many, I have several ladies that I'm working with right now that stopped having periods because they were overtraining. And for them, their body image is to be thin and just muscular. And so me asking them to literally gain some weight is very difficult because that's not in their mindset. But that's what's got to happen to make this work. Cortisol promotes fat storage, increase in appetite, <coughs> insulin, and serum glucose levels. I mean, cortisol is just kind of the, it has its place of good things that it can do. Um, it is what allows people to throw refrigerators off somebody after a tornado or help mamas pick a car up off their children. Um, where in my side of the fence, I see more of the mayhem that comes from cortisol. So one of the things of how you may want to describe polycystic ovarian syndrome, and again, I got this from um, Dr. Gersh in her, in her lecture, but she calls P2S perpetual puberty, that this never, the process never happens like it's supposed to as far as that crescendo of ovulation. So we get this estrogen spike, 
And all these follicles are making the estrogen and it's trying to get it higher, 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 and it will actually um, then have an FSH, it will have a luteinizing hormone, will happen to where it triggers in ovulation, and voila, that's the first ovulation that happens. When that occurs, then the body says, okay, we did it. Now adrenals, you don't need to keep producing DHEA and cortisol like you have been because now the body's up and running. So for these young ladies, that never happens because they don't get into having regular cycles. And so nobody tells the adrenal glands to shut it down. So these ladies have a lot more cortisol to deal with. That's why many times we see that increased weight circumference. We may see more incidences of depression, of anxiety, because again, they've, uh, cortisol is that strongest stress hormone. And so that's where she's kind of termed this as far as perpetual puberty. So women with PCOS have dysfunction of estrogen receptors in the brain, pancreas, ovaries, fat tissue, and muscle itself. Other hormone receptors can have malfunctions because of this as well, and, it just, and that is how we make progesterone, testosterone, melatonin, oxytocin, insulin, just to name a few of the other hormones that can all be affected between estrogens and um, especially the um, cortisols on board. So when you look at how a woman body works endocrine-wise, it is just absolutely amazing to me. I mean, I've been, I've been a woman's health nurse practitioner for 30 years now, and I am not bored at this at all. I just still am in awe of how the body works together and the true symphony that it takes for all of these hormones to work together. We can't just pick out and say, oh, you only need estrogen. There's really a symphony of how they, the feedback that they have to each other. But when those hormones get all kind of screwed up because of these fake estrogens that come along like the endocrine disruptors, the BPA, the Roundup, the chlorine, all that, then what it sounds like is a little bit more of like, you know, when the, when the orchestra is tuning up and you, you just want to hold your ears because it just sounds horrible, that's kind of what this is like. So instead of having that beautiful symphony, it kind of sounds like a whole much more of chaotic noise because everybody's kind of doing their own thing and there's no, like the, cor the uh, symphony orchestra leader that is leading this, it's just everybody kind of doing their own thing. <coughs> and it feels like that to many women. So what can happen when that adrenal gland doesn't get the message that it needs to chill? It, it keeps producing more cortisol and more DHEA. So the DHEA, yes, is again an androgen. And so that's where we see many times some of the androgen um, uh, acne issues of whether we see um, women who are, may have the hirsutism, the, the facial hair. And we're not talking about the peachy fuzzies that we all have, and we're going to have more peachy fuzzies as we get older. That's normal aging. And if you went to a nursing home where there's not some loving daughter or son that come and plucks mom's probably six chin hairs, that's normal. We're talking ladies that come in with those stubby, like a man's beard hair. And with this day and age of waxing and electrolysis, I have to ask. You know, when I first started out, I could tell from across the room. But now I don't know who is having that issue and who isn't. And so for that, I'm very thankful that there are options that are out there. But that, again, is why, remember, we start out of, with all, all the androgen. The androgens turn into estrogens. But if that gets screwed up, we're stuck with extra androgens or those extra male hormones that are there. Many times those extra androgens then will feed the whole issue of insulin resistance. When we get more of that tummy fat, that is absolutely toxic fat. It is, it, it's not, um, I mean, it, it is very active. It promotes cancer. Um, it, you know, we store cortisol there. Um, we, the, it definitely affects whether somebody is going to be insulin resistant. Mark Hyman, who is an integrative physician who, I'm just a groupie, I just have so much respect for him. But his, one of his quotes was, if you jump up and down and your tummy jiggles, you've got insulin resistance. 
and that's pretty well worn out most of the time. Now again, some of the the lean, you know, skinny PCOS patients, I would see that would not fit for them. But insulin resistance itself, that just is a whole nother thing that just brings in all this bad stuff of, again, more tummy fat, of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, all that. So when we get everything that's all screwed up, and these ladies are wired because they have more cortisol on board, they're not sleeping well many times um, because of cortisol issues. And so then we end up with them being insulin resistant, they're hungry all the time, they're wired, they have inflammation. Oh my gosh, they're, they, they're just totally inflamed. And we know that inflammation, again, the root of all evil, can bring in everything. They're not getting enough sleep, they're stressed, they have acne, the hair thinning um, can be their Obese young women with irregular cycles, cystic ovaries, and irritable bowel syndrome is another thing that the bowels can be all messed up on this. So when we look at inflammation in the body, the main areas that we get that is either from like gingivitis, so we all need to be flossing, um, from eating foods that we know that are inflammatory, like sugars, the wheat, barley, rye, um, or it can be foods that are good foods, like for me personally, avocados and almonds. Those are wonderful foods. I had almonds stashed like a squirrel. I had them everywhere in my car, in my desk drawer. But I was watching my inflammation markers and they were a little bit higher than I wanted. And so I'm like, what is that? So I had to do food sensitivity testing because my, I have a gut of steel. It, it wasn't helping me out at all. And so that's when I had to cut those foods out of my diet because for me, they were bad. And then the other main source of inflammation in the body, cortisol. So some of the end results of this can be, we see increased risk as far as depression. And again, some of that can be of just body image. It can be, again, because of, of cortisol issues itself. It can be because their gut is messed up. Um, David Pullmutter is an, a neurologist, another infertility guru that I'm a big fan of. And he flat out says that depression comes from the gut. And here he is, a neurologist, that's saying that. And so we spend a lot of time here trying to help clean up guts and get people off the bad food and onto the good foods to get that inflammation down. But it's also helping as far as with depression. And that's not to say that there's not a neurotransmitter aspect to depression. There is, but it's not the whole story. So it's looking at all that. Infertility, again, if you're not ovulating, this can be very hard. And some women don't ovulate for years. Other women may just skip a cycle every now and then. But it's interesting to see, um, and I had a lady that was, had, she was a chronic an ovulatory, wasn't, um, oh, for years she hadn't had periods. And she was really getting after this and doing the things that we know to help get the inflammation down. And it was interesting to see one of her saunas, because I do mid-cycle saunas for ladies who I'm trying to help get pregnant. And she had, she was starting to have regular cycles again. And one ovary looked like a totally normal ovary. The other ovary looked like a very typical PCOS ovary. And I thought, how amazing. I mean, here she is in this process of really healing herself back. And I can see this on ovaries. I mean, it just, it just kind of blew me away that day. So there can definitely be pregnancy complications for women who have PCOS. Um, I think we have better things than to just keep them on um, metformin. Um, diabetes itself, because we know that that insulin resistance, that that's going to greatly increase their risk for diabetes if we don't turn this around. Increased cholesterol, and again, just from all those other inflammatory markers that we were talking about, and lipoproteins with that high blood pressure. So you kind of start to have, see that there's more cardiovascular risk as far as stroke, heart attacks, cancer. You may have heard about metabolic syndrome and that's kind of PCOS ladies. If they don't get this turned around, that's where they're headed. Um, and arthritis, again, just being one of those very inflammatory markers or, or situations that happen. So when we look at trying to figure out where are women in the spectrum of this, one of the things is, does she have obesity? What is her BMI? Is she carrying that more around her tummy than she is around her hips? Because that does put her at increased risk if it's around her tummy, because that's that toxic fat. 
Insulin resistance itself, we check blood work as far as fasting, insulin, fasting, glucose, and see what those ratios are. Um, intestinal permeability, or you may have heard about leaky gut, and again, that's when you get the inflammation in the gut to where either bigger food particles themselves or toxicities leak through the, the little junctions in the gut and get into the bloodstream. That's not supposed to happen. But then the gut doing its thing of taking nutrients around the whole body just takes all this stuff that causes inflammation everywhere. Hormones, um, insulin itself, cortisol levels, um, DHEA testosterone levels so that we can see where is she in the continuum of all of this. And then ultrasounds of the ovaries. And again, about 85% of ladies with PCOS will have an ultrasound that does look like that string of pearls. But then there's 20% that have totally normal looking ovaries, but yet she has the other s syndromes of it. So again, it has to be so individualized. So when we look at kind of where I came from, um, one of the main treatments that we did was we knew that it was bad for women not to have menstrual cycles because, and they had all this extra tummy fat that makes estrogen. And so that's a setup to make endometrial cancer. So the lining inside the uterus grows too thick and as it grows and grows, it can go through different things of hyperplasia and it can become cancer. So well, we didn't want that to happen, so we just had ladies cycle with birth control pills. And there are some things there that I can that, that worked. I mean, it um, will decrease testosterone levels because it increases sex hormone binding globulin, which grabs testosterone and binds it up. It's also, though, unfortunately, one of the reasons why birth control pills oftentimes leads to decreased libido. Um, and also that taking away that testosterone can help with acne. So that was a major problem that some ladies had. And so that, you know, that kind of fit with all of that. But when we look at it from this reason, from the integrated side of the fence, then there's a little bit more an increased concern because we know that these ladies have a lot of inflammation. And so when we give them synthetic hormones, um, then sometimes we're going to be increasing her risk as far, and she may not be, you know, getting a whole lot of exercise and moving. So we may be increasing her risk as far as blood clots um, in the legs um, that can move and cardiovascular effects as well. So what are we going to do about all of this? So from an integrative approach, we try to get people on an anti-inflammatory diet. And basically, when I think of an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, which is what I wish I had a fairy wand and could do for every one of you who are here, what that is is that we need to be sleeping well. We need to be moving, if we can, about 30 minutes a day. Um, there's some things looking at interval training that may be making a difference with that. But it's essentially, it does help with insulin resistance and that to be moving and just outlook, all that. Um, being able to be on an anti-inflammatory diet. And so what we're a big fan of here is like a paleo uh, type diet, which means that you kick, you kick the sugars and the wheat, barley, rye, so all those glutens, pastry, the pastries, all those things, get that out of the diet because they're extremely inflammatory. And then being able to have more of a high fat component, so like the coconuts, milk, avocados, getting those good fats in there, which again, help us to not be hungry. It stabilizes glucose and insulin levels. Um, and of being able to um, increase our amount of uh, vegetables, lean meats. So when you look at a plate, it should probably be about 75% of that should be veggies. And so we, you can, especially when you look at the the idea of getting those good fats in there. Dr. Marvin has, when you go to our website and you go to the YouTube channel, which this presentation will be there, um, she did a lecture on don't fear the fats. And I would encourage you to watch that. Of again, of how that we get those higher fats can help us as far as trying to change this back around again. Then um, when we look at some of the supplements that we use, 
the methylated like B vitamins, folic acids, those are going to say things like methylcobalamin on them. If you got a cheap vitamin from Walmart, I doubt very much it's going to be methylated. And so you can have the genetics, especially if you ever heard of that MTHFR deficiency, you may have genetics that don't absorb those cheap guys very well. So when we use methylated ones, everybody can metabolize them. Um, they give us energy. They also help us to process and metabolize estrogens. Um, and to make that more, to make the, the B vitamins more um, available to the cells themselves. Um, they're water soluble, best taken twice a day. Um, B6, B12, methylfolate, all those guys. So sometimes we, you know, we have like a B active, it's just a B complex, but again, helping to get rid of those um, of the estrogens. And we can all have, of course, screwed up genetics to where in our liver, where we metabolize cortisol, where we metabolize hormones and any medications we're taking, you may have the genetics to where you don't do that as well. And that just adds in a little bit, a few more problems. So when, um, you know, as far as looking at DIM and that is again another one that helps us to process the estrogens. It's in the cruciferous vegetables, the, um, especially when we do these studies on phase one, phase two in the liver, there is a chromosome, a CYP1B1, where that, um, if you have that issue, um, then you got a little bit of a screwed up chromosome. None of us have normal, all totally normal chromosome, but some screw ups have more significance than others. And um, for those ladies, they're going to metabolize hormones down a pathway that produces more cancer many times. Um, it, they're antioxidants. They're also uh, ones of, who help to fight cancers. The sulfuric things themselves, um, these guys are very exciting to me. They are usually made from um, broccoli seed extract. Um, they induce phase two in the liver, which is again where we break down hormones and try to get them down that cancer prevention pathways. It reduces oxidative stress, which is how we age. If it's kind of how we rust from the inside out, that's oxidative stress. Um, and potential anti-cancer compound. In Europe, they use sulfurethanes just by itself as a standalone chemotherapy agent. If you went to medical websites and you typed in sulfurethanes, the clinical trials are just gonna pop up like Christmas trees, as far as the lights on a Christmas tree. It's, it's exciting, and so we, can, we put these into supplements to where we can get the benefit of that. Vitex angus, um, cactus, and it is, um, again, why I like this guy so much is that it, in, it helps to balance hormones. It increases the progesterone effect. So as I'm working with ladies who are trying to get pregnant, I don't use near the clomiphene citrate um, that I used to as far as ovulation induction. I'm using a product called um, Fem Balance MD. And why I looked at them is that, you know, when here's the deal about the old Fem Guard, now for us, Fem Balance MD, is that when I literally read about Fem Guard, I literally squealed because of, there were so many good things inside of it. And I would probably have to give five different supplements to get everything that was in FemGuard. My next squeal was when I looked at the price of it because I knew that some of the things in there were pretty pricey. And so I was extremely excited about that. It works so well as far as with PMS, with helping balance hormones, ovulation induction now. Um, ladies who are perimenopausal when they have all these high estrogens because of their older eggs that they're getting into, it helps the menopausal ladies to metabolize hormone replacement that I may have them on in a more safer manner so that they don't develop breast cancer. Well, we are now in our fifth national shortage of that product. So obviously I'm not the only one that was pretty excited about it. And so we looked at that and how much we use it and how much women were coming back. I mean, the very first time I used it was on an 18 year old who had pretty severe PMS. And it was about three weeks afterwards and I was checking out another patient and I saw mom come in and she was buying some of that and I thought, oh no, they shouldn't be out of it yet. They must not be taking it right. And I was just kind of concerned. So when I finished with um, the other patient I was working with, 
I was asking mom, how is it going? And she said, oh my gosh, in three weeks, she much, she's so much better. I'm in town, I'm buying two bottles of this because I don't want her to run out. And I was like, yes, because teenagers kind of don't, you know, I mean, they can be kind of hard to deal with. They don't give you too much credit sometimes. Uh -huh. And so to have that be the first person I even tried it on and to have that result, I was just so excited. So Dr. Davis saw that as well. And so we are in the process of having this privately uh, manufactured so we are not gonna run out again. And um, so our, our own private stock of that's gonna be up and running in October. So, very excited. So this guy is even kinda, it, it, I mean, like I say, it will knock out PMS usually in about a month. I mean, I am just so excited. Um, and then the other estrogen metabolizers that's in that product as well has some black cohosh, which is a phytoestrogen, decreases night sweats, hot flashes, um, decreases production of that LH, which is just kind of drives this whole system kind of crazy. Um, and um, so it, in, it has its place in, in, in a good uh, amount, I will say. Reservatrol is an antioxidant. It's chemically related to estrogens. Um, high doses can boost that even more. It's, um, and it comes from red grapes. Turmeric um, is a potent anti-inflammatory, powerful antioxidants, and active, it is the active ingredient that's in curcumin. Um, and it can help by lowering blood sugar levels. The research on that is ongoing. So again, turmeric is another thing that is in that product. And it is gonna be coming out on our shelves as Film Balance MD in October, which I cannot wait. Um, I literally have had ladies in here crying because we could not get any Film Guard for them. And so I'm, I'm very excited about it. Obviously, it's the best thing I've ever run into. <laughs> So fish oil itself, we know it's such a good anti-inflammatory, um, it helps to regulate blood sugars, best sources of it are cold water fish, salmon, herring, anchovy, tuna, mackerel, as especially as I was watching Dr. Marvin, her supper tonight was chowing down sardines. And so again, of getting all of those good omegas in there. I choose to, I love salmon, uh, but I kind of take it in my fish oil. Uh, otherwise, not too adventurous. Chromium itself, this is one of the things of, that's missing that they think will be part of the reason of why pregnant PCOS patients have so many issues. Um, and so we want to, it's a very important essential trace element that we want to make sure that we give back. It improves glucose control by decreasing insulin resistance and can help to lower bad cholesterol. The berberine is in many studies has even been proven to be superior to metformin, decreasing insulin resistance, decreased blood glucose levels, decreasing um, appetites in some women, help to promote weight loss. So all of these things are extra things that are out there that are available that are actually working on what the process is versus kind of just masking it with birth control pills. Progesterone, I use bioidentical progesterone um, and specifically after ovulation, because when women don't ovulate, then they're not ushering in progesterone. And progesterone is kind of mother nature's natural chill pill. It is the one that is dominant during pregnancy. Yes, we do make some estradiol and estriol in pregnancy as well. But many times when I'm trying to gauge, can, do I think a lady's gonna be able to tolerate progesterone? Because I use a lot of it with perimenopausal women particularly because they have all these high estrogens from their dysfunctional old clunker eggs. <laughs> that I'll ask them, when you were pregnant, if you could have another, if you could have babies and not have them to, to raise and pay tuition for after that, would you do that? Was it not the aches and pains of pregnancy? but did you actually really feel good during pregnancy? And there are women that say, absolutely, I never felt as good as when I was pregnant. And then there are other women that said, absolutely not, I puke the whole nine months. Well, that pretty well tells me she's not gonna tolerate progesterone very well. My job would just be so much easier if the same thing would work for everybody. <laughs> you know, but it doesn't. We can have polar experiences on that. And again, that's where you can't treat the masses on this deal. You need to be treated individually as far as what your history is and how you tolerate things. 
So because it's Mother Nature's natural chill pill, it does help promote sleep. Now there's certainly other things that we can do for ladies who have higher cortisol levels than that. And we use a, um, it's a product uh, called phosphatidylserine and it's a supplement that goes directly after cortisol, bringing that down. Um, also, um, one of my favorites is called Serenity PM and it has GABA in it as well, which is a neurotransmitter that just calms the brain. So for a lot of women, they'll say, you know, I just, I'm so tired, I really wanted to get to sleep, but I just can't shut my brain off. That was actually me last night. Not at all because I was nervous about today, because honestly, I was excited about today. I was excited to be able to tell you what I've learned so far. Now, I, I keep learning all new things, and if we did this again next year, I'd probably have all new stuff to tell you. But it was exciting to be able, that thought of being able to share this with you. And so I had to go take some Serenity PM to shut my brain off so that I could sleep last night. Usually not a problem. Um, it provides that neural calming effect, again, so that we're not as, as anxious. Because when you're under the effects of cortisol, which remember polycystic ovarian ladies make more of that because their little brains never got that message to shut it off. Um, cortisol, I describe it as like, if you, cortisol is what produces an anxiety attack, a panic attack. Anxiety many times may be kind of like somebody's got you by the throat or somebody like little uh, chest palpitations or like a little gerbil that's running on a wheel or for some ladies it can be a gut thing because there's a real gut brain connection going on as well. Whenever those things are happening, that's under the influence of cortisol. And so we know how to go after cortisol itself. We don't have to give you trazodone or other things where you may have other symptoms. We go after the issue itself that's causing the problem. Lifestyle changes as far as sleep. I always tell ladies, sleep is non-negotiable. We have to sleep. Can you tell my kids that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and you can get on the YouTube channel. Dr. Davis has a um, taped session there on sleep and some of the things, you know, that we need to do as far as good sleep hygiene because that is something that we want to teach the little itty-bitties because that is a lifelong skill that they need to learn. And so if ladies aren't sleeping, I don't care whatever. She may be bleeding all over the table. Well, maybe that's not a good example. But no, <laughs> no matter what the issue is, I'm going to start with sleep. Because I know if she's not sleeping, she's going to dip into cortisol the next day to give her energy to go when she doesn't feel like it. And there comes all the inflammation, all that tummy fat, all that insulin resistance that can happen. It just goes down the wrong path. And so I'm going to start with sleep first um, and then kind of address some of the other if she has cortisol issues. If cortisol is why she's not sleeping, I'm going to go for that first. Because if cortisol is out of balance, it's going to rock the sex hormones, thyroid, uh, leptin, all of these other hormones just pale in comparison to that. So stress reduction, whether it's through yoga and stretching, meditation, acupuncture. I had a lady today that was, she's, she's a little bit stressed, and um, she told me that she went, um, she's been hearing about yoga, so she has a friend that teaches that, and she went to her first yoga class and said so she came home and she slept like a baby. And it was just so exciting to, to see that reality of that really happening as we kind of learn to stretch it out and to just kind of put ourselves to where we can relax. We often don't do that. We know we just kind of run 90 miles up until it's time to go to bed. Okay, and there's no kind of winding down, those sorts of things. Um, the magnesium and Epsom salt baths, they're absolutely wonderful for achy muscles, but also magnesium, again, helps us to, um, to relax as well. Meditation practices, and that's kind of harder for some people to, to learn, but basically that whole thing of, of either focusing on a higher power or uh, focusing on absolutely nothing. Acupuncture, which can, again, help with the, the muscles and stimulate uh, stem cells. So mind-body therapies, sometimes of needing to meet with a counselor as far as getting more help of how to learn how to deal with anxiety, depression, kind of body self-images, those sorts of things. So, um, again, this part I just wanted to give credit to Dr. Um, Gersh, as far as from her lecture that pre she presented last year at the A4M, 
Uh, I, I was just literally floating and running to her booth at where I knew she was going to be because I was so excited about what she was saying that made so much sense to me. So we can um, stop this part so that your questions don't go out on YouTube. Mm -hmm.